Okay, one second. Just got to wait for Instagram to pick it up. And come on, Instagram. <clears throat> Make sure I have Instagram set up. I do. It says it's streaming. There it goes. So cool. All right. There we are. Okay. Welcome to Keeping It Real, the largest podcast made by real estate agents and for real estate agents. My name is DJ Paris. I'm your guide and host of this show. And today is our monthly series called Unpopular Real Estate Opinions. Now, Chris Linsell is the uh, is a real estate technology analyst, director of content at large. He specializes in new solutions to old questions, constantly exploring the cutting edge of technology in the real estate space. Chris has worked uh, has also has many years of experience as a licensed realtor in the state of Michigan and has worked as a marketer, a digital strategist, and a trainer for major national brands like Berkshire Hathaway Home Services of Michigan and Coldwell Banker Schmidt Realtors. Chris is currently the director of content with Luxury Presence and a perfect uh, guest to have today. Chris comes on regularly and today we have a lot to talk about with the recent news of the NAR agreement. Uh, But Chris is also an accomplished musician, actor, and speaker, and he is engaged with audience sizes ranging from 30 to 3,000. If you are looking for a speaker to, for example, talk about what is happening right now with the National Association of Realtors or anything else related to real estate, Chris is a great person to consider for your panel. You can reach him at chrislinsell.com. Chris, welcome once again to the show. DJ, great to be here. Holy smokes, we got a lot to talk about today. I am looking forward to digging in with you. Let's uh, let's get started. So maybe the first thing to do is to address the actual um, sort of news that happened today from National Association of Realtors. Yeah. Well, in short, the National Association of Realtors has settled, has offered a, an accepted settlement for the commission driving lawsuits um that they were found um uh that were that were found not in their favor they were the defendants of some lawsuits uh that uh, alleged that uh there was um uh anti uh antitrust behavior essentially price fixing um to uh to um compel uh sellers in real estate transactions to pay buyer's agent commissions that they did not negotiate for nor did they agree to um there are many layers to this cake but that's the those are the big driving forces um sprinkled in with uh these accusations that uh in addition to those things that the national association of realtors itself um was an organization that was predicated on uh antitrust uh driven behavior um it did not uh, allow for uh specific um and free and fair competition either between real estate professionals between um associations and um uh really uh created an unlevel playing field in the real estate space uh pretty wild stuff frankly and the National Association of Realtors took this fight to the mat. They went all the way through the uh, trial process, all the way up to a verdict, and were found uh, to be liable. I mean, you, you, there's no guilties in civil trials, um, but they were found to be uh, in uh, in violation. Um, they found found to be. Uh, um, uh the the judge found them liable for these things um and there was a verdict entered against them for 1.8 billion dollars and one thing that is important to remember here too is because of antitrust law in the united states plaint- plaintiffs in antitrust lawsuits can receive up to triple the ap- applied damages so they could have been on the hook for 5.4 billion dollars And the National Association of Realtors today, it is Friday, March 15th, um, entered an accepted settlement for $418 million worth of damages and compelling them to um, change a whole bunch of very important 
uh, rules important to the current structure of the real estate business. And those of us who follow this closely, and really anyone with a real estate license should be paying attention because we are about to have an extraordinary disruption in our industry. And we just had the head of Keller Williams recently step down. This just happened. This is a, this is a big week. I guess my, my first question is about, before we get to how did this, does this impact agents, which is obviously the most important piece for our audience, I'm just curious about the $418 million. And I know you may not know the answers to this, but I'm curious, two, two questions. I'll ask one at a time because I've learned compound questions, not great for interviewing. So I'm <laughs> trying to do better. I am trying to be a better, a better interviewer. So I will ask, first of all, does the National Association of Realtors have $418 million to pay out or do you know? Yeah, so um, obviously, I don't have a National Association of Realtors checkbook, uh, but I can tell you, uh, because of the way that um, professional trade organizations, because of the laws around taxes uh, for these sorts of things, there is a requirement for financials to be have a certain level of transparency. And um, I think at the last filing, the National Association of Realtors had somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars in terms of cash and assets. So $418 million, this is not going to be something that is going to shutter their um, their organization. Um, but, I mean, an important question to ask because had they not settled and had they been – the hammer been dropped on them, they – likely would have to file for bankruptcy uh, instead of uh, being, you know, instead of facing the possible penalties they could have received. So $418 million is, is an incredible amount of money. It isn't anywhere close to what they could have been um, uh, 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 required to pay. Um, but the short answer is, yeah, I mean, as long as they're being transparent and truthful, which every indication is that they are, they have this money. Now, whose money is it exactly? <laughs> that was my second that's, question. <laughs> that's going to be another conversation because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, like, I've paid my fair share of dues from the National Association of Realtors. Like, Are some of my dollars in there? I mean, obviously, yes. That's how this organization makes money is collects dues. I mean, actually, they make money in a lot of different ways, but a big way is by collecting dues from their you know, one and a half million members. And so... Uh, you know, the, P, the the money that's going to pay these lawsuits, that's your money. <laughs> that's my money, too. It, it, I mean, if you if you, you think about it that way, but I mean. Well, and I guess before we get into how does this impact agents, the, this idea, of, the reason I'm asking about National Association of Realtors is because they did have a stranglehold on the housing market, of course, because as it was Chris, you were actually saying this offline, and I apologize, I'm, but I should bring this to the audience's attention, is this is a very interesting uh, industry where I believe something close to 95% of residential home transactions in this country go through a realtor, which is most of those agents are going to be members of their local association, their state association, and by default, the only national association, which uh, is uh, NAR. And now with a lot of the challenges NAR has been facing, including you know what we heard today with paying out a, a, a pretty uh, nasty settlement uh, amount. I'm curious if you believe, and we have, I know we've started to see it a little bit before this announcement, but do we think that state and local associations will begin to detach from the National Association? Because one of the findings, I believe, is agents are no longer required to be a member of the National Association of Realtors. Yeah, so important distinctions to make here. The first is you can have a real estate license and not be a member of the National Association of Realtors. That has been um uh, It's always been the case. Yeah. Always always been the case. The difference is it has been a de facto requirement if you want to participate in a local MLS, correct, that you be a member of the local MLS. And how do you become a member of a local MLS? You have to join your state level Realtors Association. And how do you join your state level Realtors Association? You have to be a member of the National Association of Realtors. And then, God, I mean, it, frankly, it sounds insane to say this. 
But then factor in the reality that these local association run MLSs are in some form or another essentially just franchises of the state and national associations. So locally owned, but you're still kicking a huge vig back to the state and national associations. So in essence, up until about five hours ago, in order to participate in the local MLSs, you had to be a member of the National Association of Realtors. And that rule is changing. That is going to create some significant, um, some significantly layered conversations in local markets because you are going to have folks who are going to go indie very quickly, whether or not that allows them the same market exposure, the same access to information, the same um, ability to transact with local vendors. This is all up in the air right now. And to that point, and we'll talk a little bit about this on some other points, but this the timeline for the changes being made in the National Association of Realtors settlement of these lawsuits is so accelerated. I I would I would go as far as saying it is borderline irresponsible that these settlement changes are happening this quickly because here's what's going to happen these rule changes will structurally weaken the National Association of Realtors it will systemically disrupt the idea of compensation in every local market there's going to be significant variation and experimentation and competition in pricing that's what we expected. That's the heart of this lawsuit. But the second order effects here are that there's going to be some buyers who are going to be taken advantage of because they don't have a standard of practice that they know they can follow any longer. And NAR will not be there structurally to support business because they have had their legs chopped out from underneath them. So Agents are going to be on their own, and consumers are going to be relatively weakened, at least in the short run, in some cases, because of this. Could, could you speak to the idea of buyers potentially being taken advantage of? Yeah, absolutely. So put yourself, I'm going to give you a scenario here. Let's say that you go to the supermarket and you need a gallon of milk. And the prices for every gallon of milk are just stickered right on there. Here's how much the here's how much the milk costs. Here's how much the two percent, the whole milk, the, uh, the skim milk. Here's how much it all costs. I can go to the milk aisle. I can pick up a, a, a gallon of milk. And say, okay, here's how much this costs. I'm going to go to the checkout and I'm going to buy it here. Imagine a store with no prices, and I pick up a gallon of milk and I walk up to the checkout lane and I say, I'd like to buy this, and they say, okay. Well, we think this milk is going to cost you $6.50. And if I've never bought milk before, I might say, oh, okay, $6.50. That seems fair. But if the guy behind me, he's been in here, he's in here every week buying milk. He knows that he can get milk for $3.50. He's going to walk up there and he's going to say, oh, yeah, I'd like to this and uh, that'll be $3.50, please. And the store is like, well, we'd like you to pay six fifty, dollars but okay, three fifty dollars is fine. It is going to be it, the, I mean, I, I don't use this term lightly, but the, the perversion of justice here is that the idea behind some of these rule changes is to open home ownership up to more buyers, but in actuality... It is going to create a layer of opaqueness in terms of how much services do and should cost that is going to create a level of uncertainty, especially for folks who are new uh, to the housing market, folks who don't have a, a high level of financial literacy. The folks who are the most vulnerable are likely to be the ones who will pay the most not the least the folks who are who have the most resources and know the most 
The folks who have the ability to pay more will not pay more. The folks who have the least and know the least will pay the most. This is, I mean, it's an absolutely backward uh, result from the intended uh, rule change. Can I say that I, I agree? It, it reminds me of the conversation we had around wholesaling uh, about a year or so ago. It, there's there's hints of 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 that in 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 this um, in, in this. It, it, I will tell you what I was a little disappointed with. I'm curious to get your take. When I received the email from the National Association of Realtors this this morning, um, I was a little disappointed that I didn't see. Here's what we're going to do. Here are some solutions, and it was very just matter of fact. <laughs> and I I thought, you know, um, I was expecting more from leadership of like, here we we have some ideas to solve this problems. We'll be. Re- you know, we'll be talking about that in in future weeks, months. But you're right; the deadline is coming up pretty quick on when these changes go into effect. And I did, and I really didn't see any hope in that announcement from National Association of Realtors that they had a solution. You know, I, I got to be honest with you. Well, actually, let me start off before I say this because it's not going to be super popular uh, opinion for for many people. Um, I am actually a fan of the National Association of Realtors for a number of reasons. The primary reason being, I believe that there is a level of cooperation and coordination necessary amongst real estate professionals in order to provide uh, appropriate uh, and high quality service for communities. My 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 reason, the short reason that I say that is that. We are working in an industry where compromise is a required component to get buyers and sellers to the table together. And so if buyer and seller agent relationships are adversarial, that cooperation happens much less frequently and the end results are much less beneficial for all parties. I actually believe despite all of the stuff that is a part of this lawsuit, which some of it is very legitimate, I actually believe the National Association of Realtors has served a net positive in creating a, 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 a surface of coordination and cooperation. That being said, the messaging that came out of NAR this morning is prompting many who are who to follow and commentate here, myself included, to suggest that these reforms are going to spur the competition, the rise. Uh, they're going to catalyze the rise of a potential NAR competitor. This group, the National Association of Realtors, has an unprecedented influence and money and access. They have, uh, they literally, it, it is a professional trade group that has literally every single number of every single real estate transaction in, in every single county in the United States. They know a ton. They have, I mean, I said it earlier, they got a bank account w- with with a billion dollars in it, in, in cash and assets. They have the most powerful, I don't care who tells me that, that tech has a more powerful lobbying group. The NAR has arguably the most powerful lobbying wing in the entire United States political system. And the reason is they have a group that is built on the idea of forced unionization. If you want to be a realtor, I even see I, I, I like we've the term isn't even realtor. The term is real estate agent. Realtor is the name of the of somebody who belongs to the organization. They have it is they they have created a system that requires you to be a part of the club if you want to be even close to this industry. These rule changes are going to change that and it's going to make a space for a competitor to come out of the woodwork. Now, maybe that's a good thing for the National Association of Realtors. Maybe it's a good thing for professionals. But I tell you one thing, the next six to 12 months in the real estate industry are going to be chaotic. And that's going to translate to our clients as well. There is going to be a certain amount of disruption uh, and will be magnified in in certain markets because just because of the housing stock, because of the typical prices there. This is going to be 
um, a, a, a summer of that we'll never forget. We'll put it that way. And I, I, I put it on the same level as like the first summer of the housing crisis in 2008, the, the first summer of the savings and loan crisis. Like it, it is that level of disruption that we're about to see here. Well, you brought up a good point that National Association of Realtors is really the only uh, powerful trade group in the housing uh, real real estate agent space, and they basic uh, they don't n- require membership, but in order to participate as an actively practicing agent, it, at least on the residential side, you essentially have to become a member, and also to receive uh, certain types of errors and omissions insurance. There are uh, you know so insurance companies are, are tied to this as well, and of course we all know that that's just you know we were all part. We all were essentially pretty well persuaded to join this union, whether we liked it or not. And 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 again, I know it's not technically considered a union, but uh, essentially operates very similarly. And so, I guess the question is, right now, I would I would love before we get into any more of the specifics, I just want to help the agents who are now getting phone calls from their clients going, I just saw this news. It's it's literally national headlines and it is uh, above the fold national headlines. These are big, this is a big story. What would you tell a client who calls and says, hey, what's going on right now? So there is, there's so much to talk about um, with our clients right now. But the first thing out of every agent's mouth right now when they're talking to their clients about this is not about the national association of realtors it's not even about commissions it's just about value the very first the very first conversation that professionals with their clients need to be having is listen there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in the real estate industry right now what does not change no matter all of the other stuff but what does not change is my commitment to you my fiduciary duty to you, my personal commitment to provide you with the services that you need in order to execute on the goals that you have. That's it. Full stop. That's, that's a great answer. That's, that should be the, the, I mean, it should be the only thing that is, is in that first conversation. All of the other stuff is secondary to that. If your clients are confident in that, then you're groovy. You're, I mean, it, frankly, all the other stuff is going to fall in behind it. Here's what you could do wrong though. If, Somebody calls you up and asks you some questions about this. If you start talking about, oh, well, there's going to be some alternative compensation models and, oh, well, you know, maybe some, you know, maybe buyer's agents won't be doing as much or uh, maybe, you know, it'll be the responsibility of buyers to do, you know, X, Y, and Z on their own and then buyer's agents will come. Like, that is you explaining how your job and your responsibility is changing. Right. That's a terrible idea because... Honestly, that's not actually true, at least not right now. I'm not saying that it couldn't be true, even in the semi-near future. But in the next 6 to 12 months, this is why things are about to get so difficult, is our responsibilities to our clients are not changing. But the way that we interact with them with our checkbooks is. And this is going to cause some significant discomfort for a lot of folks, both on the client and the agent side. Another thing that I would add in, just just to kind of close the answer to this question, is as you are thinking about buyers and assuring them of your commitment to them, continuing to assure them that they, especially buyers, man, I just have to stop and say this, this is especially true for buyers, assuring them that they will continue to have access to the properties on the market regardless of what's going on. Um, with the National Association of Realtors is critical. The last thing you want is your buyers to think that because of all of this stuff going on in the industry, that there is a possibility that they won't have the opportunity to see homes that are available what because it's of commission structures or because of who lists them. That is a, a poison pill for the industry. That is the moment that confidence begins to erode in the uh, seriousness and professionalism of real estate. If we have even an ounce of our clients thinking that there are going to be some homes they can see and some homes they can't 
by virtue of the brokerage you belong to, then we got, I mean, I mean, this is, uh, it's, it's a civil war. I, I mean, at that point, it, there is, there's no coming back from it. Then, then we blow up and start over again, frankly. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about some of the actual settlement, um, main talking points. First, yeah. th this is probably no surprise to the audience, but using buyer agency agreements are now going to be required, um, which will also stipulate compensation. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or they can compensate. They can talk about compensation if you, mm -hmm. as the buyer representative, uh, buyer agent representative, if you want to be compensated, um, mm -hmm. and you are going to have to have your client sign a form that is an agreement about exactly how you're going to be compensated, at if and when you know that actually happens. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, actually, a couple things to just clarify on this because the language is a little murky, ironically, it is. Um, in this. But as I'm interpreting it. What the the major rule change here uh, that is important here is that NAR is establishing a ban on any sorts of rules that would allow a seller's agent to uh, the uh, seller's agent to excuse me. <laughs> See, even I'm getting it wrong. This is the 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 verbiage is really important here. Yeah. The one of the rule one of the things as a part of the settlement is a ban on NAR establishing any sort of rules that would allow for a seller's agent that would allow a seller's agent to set comp for a buyer's agent so what's important here the distinction is the ban is that the nar can't set these rules sellers agents can still do this it is not outlawing the practice of offering buyers compensation as a part of a listing contract that has not been outlawed. What has been outlawed uh, is NAR, any rule from NAR even insinuating a mandate that that has to happen. And to right. be fair, the National Association of Realtors has always said that they do not have a uh, mandate for this, that you don't have to do this. In fact, you can. Um, I, I remember actually when I was a, a junior agent working on a team, there was a... a a broker on the team who would consistently he would take a five percent commission total total commission he would take three and a half percent and he would put one and a half percent in the buyer's agent field um he's like there's no rule that says that has to be split i can put whatever i want in here um and i'll be honest with you he didn't have the best um uh reputation within our professional community he didn't care uh but that was a that was uh just that was the reality. And just generally speaking, the National Association of Realtors will tell you there has never been a rule that says you have to split commissions. You have to even offer a commission where the problem was and what the lawsuit eventually found was, even though it doesn't say it in writing, it is based on standards and practices. It is an unwritten implicit rule, a practical requirement that you follow this unless you want to be blackballed from the community, essentially. Right. Yep. If you're, if you, the listing agent, are not offering a, well, reasonable is, is a subjective term, but but what the market and other agents consider to be a reasonable compensation on the buy side, uh, are agents going to sort of just for their own self interest potentially not show those properties? The answer in a perfect society would be, nope, they'll show them no matter what, if there's compensation or not. But uh, because as a fiduciary, we do have, th this is the, the whole issue is as a fiduciary, you have to show the properties that are going to be in your client's best financial interest and the mm -hmm. best to meet their potential objectives, irrespective of the commission. So I do like in theory, this idea that now going forward, MLS listings will not showcase, here's how much you're going to get paid, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer Agent, if you bring me uh, a a client because i believe that is no starting in july you will no longer see the cooperative compensation field on any listing uh that's correct uh, is, okay yeah that's so, correct so my, my question is yeah what how are agent who how are buy side agents going to know if the buyer is going to pay the commission 
or if the seller and the, the listing agent have an agreement to split the commission or give a portion of that commission to the buy side agent. Is that just going to be part of the negotiation, part of the conversation um, before uh, somebody goes to see a property, after they see the property and are interested in putting an offer in? I'm curious mm. of where that conversation is going to, going to start uh, happening. Well, that's a great question, but and actually, before I even dig into that, I just I take a little issue even with the premise of the question, um, only because um, I think that there is there's a lot of of inflammatory talk around um, the effect of the scenario that you just described, even from folks that I really respect. Like Deborah Kamen has an article in the New York Times this morning where she uh, basically outlines. Uh, what she just calls critics uh, of this practice say that by displaying the um, the compensation levels publicly, it results in steering, which is basically real estate professionals will steer their clients to transactions with higher commission opportunities for them instead of um, of treating all homes equal opportunity. I'm not suggesting that that doesn't happen. I am suggesting that the level that that happens is there just, I have, show me the evidence. I'm happy to. Yeah, I, I, feel I, I feel the but, same way. I feel the same way. The evidence of steering by virtue of commission rates, it just is flimsy. And I, somebody send me something on LinkedIn to point to the fact that this is a real problem. So p putting those, those problems aside, to your question of how does compensation even work now that we don't know, I have a couple of different ideas. The first idea is that it takes place as a um, as a component of contract negotiation at the offer level. So um, you buyer agents negotiate with their clients as to what their expectation for payment is. That is then that that number is then built into the contract negotiation such that a buyer will come with an offer that says i'd like to offer you $400,000 for your home plus a $10,000 concession for real estate commissions that is i think a com that is a possibility and Another by the way if if that were, i'm sorry if that were to happen is that really much different than what we're currently doing now it's, anyway? It is It is literally just semantic at this <laughs> point. But here's the problem. Here's the significant problem. In order to qualify for a mortgage, you have to demonstrate that the property being, or excuse me, that the contract being um, executed is for the purposes of purchasing real property only. In other words, you cannot include in the purchase of a real estate legally, you can't include something like a lawnmower. You couldn't include um, uh, a trip to the Bahamas. You couldn't include braces for your kids. You couldn't include a concession to pay for braces for your kids. It is That is equivalent to... I'd like you to pay for my real estate commission as well. This is a non-real property or service. Traditional mortgages will not cover this. They will require or they will require anything within uh, the contract to be considered real property or to be a part of the currently accepted uh, exceptions to that rule, which won't come anywhere close to the dollar numbers that most real estate commissions will be seen. So this is a possibility, um, the, the offering of a, of a concession relative to it. The semantics will have to be just right. And where I think we're going to run into some real problems is financing. Um, but banks seem to figure out ways to get more money. So I'm not super concerned that that would be a long-term forever problem. But honestly, I mean, it's not impossible to say the tightening of financial regulations following the housing crisis of 2008 and 2009 
have made it more difficult for banks to wiggle in their language of mortgage-based contracts. So there may not be room to wriggle, to wiggle around here. It, it really could be a, a, a significant um, question here. I, I don't know. I don't know what will happen with that. Yeah, it's it's very interesting what what we'll see. I think the what I as if I were practicing today, I would be very uh, interested in practicing my buyer representation pitch to just to talk about the different ways I as the agent could be compensated going forward. Uh, I think that we need to start having tougher conversations with buyers to explain to them that they may be responsible for making up a difference if if the seller isn't willing to pony up uh, the mm-hmm. co-op commission. And mm-hmm. buyer agents are going to have to defend their commissions. In the past, it was you know, largely invisible, uh, the, these mm-hmm. commissions. They, they weren't seen as something coming out of the buyer's pocket, which of course technically it was, but but it was obs- obfuscated with all of the different layers that exist. Now it's it's going to be possibly a check that they are writing to or uh, figuring out a way to get that person paid. And so I think what's most important is agents really need to start talking about what are they doing to earn that buy side commission. A hundred percent. You know, what I think, you know, not to turn from, you know, one gloom and doom day to another, but um, uh, one, uh, one other element to this that I think is um, even potentially even more challenging is that the uh, change, the expected change by regulators as a part of this settlement is that these changes are going to eventually, in fact, I mean, not even eventually, almost immediately, frankly, based on this timeline, are expected to to actually drive housing prices down. And I am here to say, not only is this not going to happen, but housing as a result of this is about to get more expensive for buyers. And here's why. When you look at the house, the price of a home that's on the market, let's say you've got a home that's $500,000. Okay. And let's just say for the sake of, of, um, of simplicity here, there's a right now, like before all these changes are going to happen, there's a 5% commission on this, on this home, total compensation of 5%. So you look at this this home, it's for sale for 5%. When you look at that home, you don't say, oh, that home is worth $475,000. Nobody does the commission math. The buyers don't look at this and say, oh, this home's value is is $475,000 with a $25,000 commission. Sellers don't do this math either. Sellers look at the home, they look at their CMA, they look at the market, they say, my home's worth $500,000. Agents don't do this math. I mean, I, I, b- banks don't do this math. Appraisers don't do this math. Inspectors don't do this math. Nobody does this math. So here's what's going to happen. If we take the buy side commission and starch it out of the uh, transactional process, the expectation is that that's going to be returned in value to the market. But that's not going to happen because nobody does the commission math. What's going to happen here is that that 2.5% that was going to the buyer's agent is now going to just be returned as increased proceeds to the seller. Yeah, It is going to create a scenario where the rich stay richer and the poor get poorer because the owners of the home are going to be able to keep more of the proceeds of their sale and the buyers of the home will now be required to compensate their buying agent 
which will reduce their total purchasing power. And it will create a scenario where fewer people have access to home ownership, especially in these pivot markets where we have home ownership that is literally the difference between affordable and unaffordable is $5,000 for some people. And when you are when you become cash responsible because a mortgage won't cover the compensation of your agent, you won't work with an agent any longer. Your access to housing will be diminished. Your ability to get into properties will be less. This and, is going and to your result. access your access to professional services on the buy side will also 100%. be be reduced. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So all of this is likely going to result in a less balanced housing market, not a reduction in cost. You know, there is uh, who was it like um, uh, Norman Miller? I think is uh, he's a professor emeritus uh, at uh, of real estate in uh, you know, University of San Diego. Said that uh, his his quote this morning was that this is going to blow up the market and would force a new business model. And I think that that is true, but a new business model after we absolutely decimate the existing one by virtue of cre- i mean it, this is going to completely throw the the real estate market or has the potential of completely throwing the real estate market into chaos before it does it yes a new business model is likely to emerge here but not uh, not on the grounds of, like the fertile un unplowed grounds of a field out in the middle of the woods it's going to be rebuilt uh, like on the ashes of the homes they just burned down first. I mean, it's potential of being very dramatic here. It's, yeah, and I'm also too, I'm going, I'm interested and I'm curious to get your take on will MLS listings um, or the saturation that MLS has in the housing market really all over the country. Of course, there are, uh, non-MLS transactions that happen, but they are usually on the residential side, at least in the minority. Will we start to see fewer MLS listings as a result? Hmm. You know, I think that is a very interesting second order effect that is certainly possible. Um, I don't see that being the case immediately solely for the fact that we don't have infrastructure to support non-MLS listings. Now, what could happen here? I, frankly, I think this this would be amazing. Well, is, there is one company that has the infrastructure to possibly become oh, an MLS replacement. Weird. I wonder which company that would be. <laughs> well, who, Actually, there's it's, there's even more than just one, but there is one that certainly we we would probably think of first. You know, I I agree with you. And for anyone who is is wondering, we're talking about Zillow here. <laughs> The reason why I don't think that that's necessarily the case is that Zillow's entire business model is built on the back of um, IDX integration with MLSs. If MLSs go away, Zillow doesn't have uh, the data to feed. It would require a, a sort of manual subscription and upload. Now, that being said, I have been a longtime advocate for a national MLS. Um, and the idea that we could transform Zillow into a pseudo national MLS is very uh, interesting to me. Um, and for those of you who have uh, like a gag reflex around the idea of Zillow getting more into your business, I just want to remind you, and again, I like the National Association of Realtors. There is no hate in my heart here, but I just want to remind you, this is not a community organization sponsored by the local Baptist church. This is a for-profit entity who is in the business of creating opportunity, yes, for its members, yes, for the communities they serve, but yes, for themselves. This is a business. Zillow is a business too. I would venture to say there is a better opportunity for a broader, more applicable service run by a tech company like Zillow instead of uh, the sort of structure and priorities necessary to hold together the National Association of Realtors. That's a whole other conversation. But long story short, um, 
will we start to see more listings translate off the MLS? I think it is possible. And I think there could be there could be a, a scenario where this actually becomes really, really cool. The reason is and and is that I, I have said for a long time, for most real estate transactions, the MLS does 95% of the work for you. It distributes the property to all of these different groups that have IDX feeds. It puts your property out where listing agents and buying agents uh, and interested buyers can see it. It does essentially almost all of the marketing. during when, when, when inventory is tight and it's like a crazy hot market, it does all the marketing. You put it up on the MLS, you get 10 offers without even showing it. Imagine a world where that no longer happens. And the only way to get exposure to listings is by your listing agent being the best damn marketer in the entire uh, 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 organization, association. It will become a pure meritocracy on the strategies of property marketing, on the strategies of exposure, on strategies of finding the right set of uh, buyers via the audience and the channels that they choose, real estate could become a renaissance industry for successful marketing. Because all of a sudden, we wouldn't have this, uh, a, this I mean, let's call it what it is. Like the MLS is just a generic um, grocery store where all the shelves are all the same. Everybody's product sits on the same uh, amount of shelf space. They just You just walk up and down the aisles. You select, uh, you know, you go to the aisle that has the right kind of house for you. Just walk up and down. That's it. You just choose one off the shelf. That's it. Imagine a world where the only way to find the right market or the only way to find the right house is to uh, to have property marketing that connects you to the right home. Now you have a real meritocracy around who's best at listing property and you even get a meritocracy around buyer's agents who are best at finding the right property. If I had to do it, if I, like if I was in the driver's seat, I don't think I would abolish the things that the uh, that this this settlement has abolished. I think I'd be going after the MLS. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, I it reminds me of when I've had people on our show, uh, agents, top agents who sell uh, list these mega mega properties where you know we're talking 10 million and above and the MLS does not do the marketing for them on properties yeah. like that because it's just not what the average consumer who has access to the MLS is is going to be able to afford so these listing agents have it, it, for for ever since it existed, the responsibility of actually, in a lot of cases, finding the buyer and having connections to other real estate agents who represent buyers who can afford, uh, you know, those types of properties. And it is not just on the MLS. And then I just wait for those offers to come in. So I do agree. There is this will agents who know how to market properties. If if the MLS becomes not the de facto place where where everything's listed, yes, you're yeah. right. It is going to be a, a scramble to figure out how do we push out uh, properties to other agents, also to buyers directly. I am curious. Do you think, just as a buy side question again, <laughs> do we think buyer agency could be going away? Buyer representation, rather. And, and I, I want to preface that with 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 one one little statistic. So, uh, and again, going away is would be a very extreme uh, example uh, or extreme um, uh, sort of thing that would happen. But T, what's the name of the? Sorry, I just uh, lost it. But there, uh, some. My apologies, I, I lost it. But there was a. Uh, it is. It is. It is suggested that buyer commissions may come down 25 to 50% uh, by a uh, research organization as a result of this. Because again, buyers are now likely going to have to figure out compensation. And of course, that makes it harder for home ownership. Um, do we think that this possibly changes? You know, I know we've talked about this before. Could it be a scenario where an agent only gets paid on the listing side, helps the buy side for free or a nominal fee? 
and makes it affordable for the buyer to, especially first time home buyers, to be able to afford their services and then says, well, I'll make it up on the back end when, when they sell. I think that there is a world where dual agency becomes the, um, becomes the standard practice in real estate. And the reasons primarily are the ones that you outlined. It's going to become difficult to figure out, at least in the short run, how to pay buyer's agents effectively and consistently. It's going to be difficult for buyer's agents to develop business models around um, the work that they do because they won't be able to consistently plan on how much money they're going to make a transaction to transaction or even how they're going to make money transaction to transaction. So these are threats to the, the immediate threats to um, buyer's agency. And I also think that these rule changes could very um, closely be followed by rule changes that um, redefine the responsibilities of an agent that is engaged on both the buyer and seller side, such that uh, right now there is there there are rules around uh, dual agency that essentially, I mean, uh, frankly, most most of the rules essentially say um, you can represent both sides, but when it comes right down to it, you're representing the seller, and the buyers right. just kind of kind of figure it out themselves. Um, in in those scenarios. It would not surprise me if these changes are followed by changes in 24, 36 months that change the, the rules around dual agency and the requirements for agents to practice. Um, that being said, I don't believe that buyer's agency is gone and, or will go because there are, um, there are, there are too many scenarios that require specific advocacy for a consumer to be successful when purchasing real estate. And when I say like advocacy, I mean dedicated exclusive advocacy. I think that there will be a rise in non-agency driven purchases in the same way that over the last 20 years, we've seen the rise in the purchase of automobiles that don't come from dealerships. Like you can go buy a car from Carvana and not even talk to a human being. You can just type about it, right? In the same way that we never used to buy our own airline tickets. We go to a travel agent for that. Now, I, I mean, I genuinely bought an airline ticket on my phone while eating something last night at the same time. At the same, uh, the same way that business will evolve via disruption, the auto industry evolved via disruption because new technology made it made the information necessary to be successful accessible. You can argue that Zillow did that 20 years ago within the real estate space, or at least started that conversation. We would not be having this conversation right now if Zillow didn't shine a light in a dark room 20 years ago, because we would all still be dependent on our agents in order to get access to the information necessary to buy and sell homes. The more information we have access to, the less we are dependent on those systems in order to be successful in those transactions. But uh, there is a certain amount of experience and expertise necessary in still a measurable percentage of buyer situations that I think is still going to require advocacy. So to sure. that end, I can't imagine that this is going to go away completely. I do think there is going to be a natural shrinking of buyer representation. And I think we're going to see, a, and, and, and in the interim, as the contraction of traditional buyer agency happens, we're going to see an expansion of alternative uh, buyer representation comp. Like we'll see flat fees, we'll see subscription based buyer agency services. You know, you pay 50 bucks a month um, to get access to uh, information and advice. And then when you go to actually buy the, uh, buy the home, 
you know, you pay a three hundred and fifty dollar contract fee, and that's about it. I I can see worlds where all of that stuff evolves and emerges here, um, but it's gonna be a it's gonna be a summer in the hot tub. <laughs> With all of us kind of trying to, you know, keep from banging our knees into each other. And, and it's going to be difficult and uncomfortable. But I'm also confident we're going to come out on the other side okay. I, I agree. And other industries have gone through a similar sort of evolution, right? We fi Financial advisory services certainly have. Attorney services have. Where now you can pay a subscription fee to, you know, ask Charlie or whatever the, the big popular ones these days are. Um, and you can get legal advice you can get accounting advice you you can you know buy a subscription fee and purchase all the stock that you want without paying commissions there are lots of 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 alternative compensation models based on how much value is being provided and i think you're right we're going to start seeing a lot of those discount models or or at least more transactional or even subscription based models start to take hold and i think the value, as you said, the expertise of a really educated and experienced agent is I think those agents don't have that much to worry about because I think they're going to be able to justify whatever the cost is to the buyer, if if any, uh, based on that experience. And they're going to have data to, to, to back up. Here is why I am worth X. And in fact, agents, buyer agents should really be having Mavs conversations right to date anyway, regardless of of this outcome. Um, but I think that is going to force, I think it's going to force agents to really up their game with respect to demonstrating and, uh, and, and persuading people that their value is what they're charging. hundred percent. I'll say I, I have the same message, the same parting words that I say to folks when I talk to them about AI, if your value as a real estate professional is tied to your ability to access the MLS, to punch in a code on a lockbox, if your value is tied to your ability to execute tasks, AI is going to eat your lunch. It's going to take your job and eat your lunch. If your value is tied to your ability to provide expert level service to um to uh, uh, create action around your unique ex um, experience and uh, and uh, ability to use your knowledge of your local micro local community to give your agents an advantage or your 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 clients an advantage. If that's where your value as a professional sits, AI is not going to take your job. You are going to be totally fine. In fact, you're going to do better. And the same is true for buyers agents. If your uh, value is tied to your ability to have access to the MLS, to stroke a pen across a contract, and to punch in a lockbox code, this should be very worrying to you. But if your value to your client base is connected to your unique experience, your specific knowledge of the market that you serve, and your ability to create advantage for your clients by virtue of those experiences, you're going to be fine. It's going to have you're going to have a few more conversations, and there's going to be some sticky ones to figure out the logistics. But all of that, you're just you just have to take a, a a different path to the city of Oz. Now it's just not going to be the same yellow brick road you've always walked down. But you're still going to get there. I also wanted to just leave our, our audience with a suggestion, and curious, Chris, to get your take on this suggestion, uh, whether you agree or want to amend it or or, or dis discount it. But I think now the agent is going to have a lot more power to demand from their local state and national association, if, if, you ch if they choose to continue to be members, uh, more advocacy and certainly more direction and guidance. And I think right now, you know, this is a time to be reaching out to your associations and saying, hey, I'm nervous, I'm worried. What are you doing to protect my job? Or, or the way I'm compensated for my services. What are the best practices that you've seen working, and what are you the working on to you know ensure that I'm going to have you know a, a way to a pathway to earn a living going forward? And I really will encourage people to reach out to their associations and say this is this is a pretty serious thing. I pay a bunch of money to you every quarter or every year. I would like to know what you are doing to help me. And that is their job. 
And so I encourage you, I, I'm somebody who volunteers at the local level. I love uh, our local association. I like our state and national association. I'm on the same page with Chris. Now is the time to demand some action um, because they have, uh, you know, made, they, 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 First, uh, National Association claimed that they would appeal this uh, verdict once other, um, as Chris said, that the, the 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 potential downside to that was that they could be found guilty of a multiple of what they are en- ended up paying now. So it makes sense why they settled from a financial perspective. But now it's time to really hold their feet to the fire and say, what are, what are we going to do going forward? How okay. should we do this? What are the best practices? This is why you pay them. Hundred percent. Yep. This is an opportunity to uh, to apply some of that professional pressure to um, make sure that you have uh, the opportunities that you deserve, especially for the money that you pay. And I would add, this is also a great opportunity to have a conversation with your broker um, uh, and uh, with the owners of of your brokerage to say, "Listen, things are changing. What are our plans as a company?" What are our plans as a franchise? And specifically, what are we going to do to remain competitive in this space? Both to uh, give our clients the best services possible, but also to maintain the best relationships with the agents in the brokerage. This is a, a natural inflection point to have that conversation. Brokers, if you're listening, be ready. You're going to have these conversations a lot um, because there is going to emerge just like we've been talking about a competition uh, amongst uh, pricing models for buyers agency, we are about to see the emergence of competition between brokerages who have new models. Who I, I don't, I don't think it's impossible at all. I, in fact, I would guess there will be a major real estate brand that is going to come out with a salary-based bro or buyers agent program very soon. And and, I don't and to like, be fair, Redfin has kind of had a similar model for for years and years now. Yeah, and uh, I, that is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, certainly a good thing to look at. But the size and scope of the Redfin program was experimental relative to the number of real estate professionals in the country. We are about to get an influx of agents who have no idea whether or not the clients that they're currently working with are going to pay them. These are folks who have mortgages and light bills and college tuitions come and do. They are going to want uh, some assurances that the work that they're doing is going to be compensated for. So if you are on the lookout for how that is going to be, uh, how you are going to um, create those assurances in your work life. Talking to your local association, the state and the national association of realtors, definitely good. But remember, those folks don't stroke your checks. Your brokerage, Coldwell Banker, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Century Twenty One, Redfin, Compass, Side, all of these folks are a, they have they are in the line of uh, money that passes from. Uh, from one side to the other, the transaction. So these are folks that you should be in conversations with too. Great point to wrap up with. Chris, thank you for your take on this. It was uh, something that happened. We we had this uh, episode scheduled for, for some time and it just happened to fall on the day where this news dropped. So I'm so grateful that you uh, were able to pivot and have a really uh, wonderful conversation and a lot of insight and it, you know, just suggestion around how agents should handle this news and, and specifically even just talking about how should they talk with their clients that in and of itself, uh, hopefully would provided a lot of value to people. So please, mm. everyone, um, I would also like to know what is your, not Chris, but all the listeners, what is your biggest concern about what's happening right now with these uh, changes? Where, where are you the most uh, afraid? And please let us know, and Chris and I can attempt to tackle these in future episodes. So we want to thank Chris, of course, for his uh, his his ability to sort of take something that is seemingly scary and 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 
comprehensive and distill it down into sort of bite-sized information that we can go out and use. So thank you, Chris, on behalf of the uh, the audience and on behalf of Chris and myself, thank you for tuning in today. We appreciate it. We are going to continue to follow the story. Of course, we are here to serve you, the audience. You guys are the reason we can keep doing these shows. So please support our sponsors. Please tell a friend and let us know what you would like to see more or less of on the show so we can continue to be of value to you. Um, on behalf of uh, Chris and myself, thank you, Chris. Thanks again. We will see everybody. Uh, oh, Chris, I'm so sorry. Let's make a plug. Chris is obviously a well-educated and opinionated uh, and well well sought, well thought uh, out speaker, and he is sought out as well. So this would be a perfect opportunity to mention that Chris speaks all over the country and actually speaks at the National Association of Realtors Conference or has for many years. So Chris, uh, if there is a brokerage or a local or state or even the National Association that would like to, uh, or, or regional events as well, private third party conferences, um, or maybe the brokerage has a sales meeting. And Chris, what's the best way someone should reach out if they'd like you to speak? Come over to my website, chrislincell.com. Uh, feel free to fill out a form. I'm happy to uh, have conversations with you. If you don't want to do that, you can just connect with me on social. You can find me on LinkedIn. Pretty active there. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, those are two good spots that I spend time. And if you happen to be in Southwest Florida, I'll be speaking at Southwest Florida Tech Con uh, the week after next. Actually, you know what? Just in case, that is, I'll be there on March 26th. And I will be at the Minneapolis Association of Realtors Realtor Summit on April 11th in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So if you're in either of those areas, I'd love to see you. And if you're doing some future planning, you can uh, put down on your calendar. I'll be speaking um, at the Raycon Conference in Edmonton, Alberta this September. So if you're in Canada, boy... I love Canada. Thanks for thanks for doing all you do. Maple syrup is fantastic. I eat it just about every day. Appreciate all your all your good work up there. Awesome. Well, follow Chris at uh, on social media, in particular Instagram, LinkedIn. Follow him on his website, chrislinsell.com. Consider him for any industry speaking events. He is one of the most sought after journalists in this space, and he is also a realtor. So he is on your side. He understands your needs, and he is happy to speak to your audiences. So Chris, thank you so much. We will see everybody on the next episode. Thanks, DJ.